again, I, I like to use this term uh, emotional intelligence, the steps that focus on what they need and how you can address their needs. It's like the job market equivalence of emotional intelligence. Yeah. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. On today's episode, we have Dr. Laura Schweitzer. Dr. Schweitzer is a president emeritus and more recently on a part-time remote basis is the vice president for health sciences at SUNY University at Albany. Dr. Schweitzer also coaches women and applicants underrepresented in medicine on how to secure high-level administrative jobs in academic medicine, academic engineering, and university administration. She has helped to place chancellors, college presidents, vice presidents, deans, and chairs, and in fact was my job coach and helped me secure my position here at Hopkins when I was assistant dean for faculty development. So yes, she is wonderful, my own personal testimony. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. Thank you, Kim. I'm so glad to be here. Well, I know that we're having worked with you when I got this job and you helped coach me through that process was that you said that more than any other skill, you like to work with us, your clients, to clearly identify what the hiring institution needs so that me as a job applicant, I can demonstrate how I meet that institution's needs. As people are thinking about listening to your wisdom today, I want to remind the listeners that you can get a hold of Dr. Schweitzer and her, through her email, and it's going to be on the facultyfactory.org website, but her email address is schweitzerl at mac.com. I'm going to spell that for you, schweitzerl at mac.com, and it is S-C-H-W-E-I-T-Z-E-R-L, so that's schweitzerl at mac, M-A-C.com. So... Laura, how did you come up with your winning formula for coaching individuals? Well, Kim, you know, before I started coaching, I served on many, many search committees, including at two medical schools where in my uh, role as an administrator, I was responsible for all executive level searches, like searches for department chairs, deans, and endowed chairs. And so I got to sit through all of those searches, and I observed a lot of winning candidates and, unfortunately, a lot of losing candidates. And I tracked the winning formulas, and I noticed a trend that winning the job was less about the candidate's credentials in the end than it was about the attention that those candidates paid to what was needed at the institution. Now I share all of that wisdom that I gained through dozens of searches with my clients through the coaching that I do. If you think about it, it makes sense. You can hire someone great, but if they don't come with the skill set and experiences that you need, then the hire will not work. Does that make sense to you, Kim? It, totally. Yeah. I, I, right away, I'm thinking not only for looking to get a new job or to to seek a new job, but I'm thinking as you're talking, wow, if I'm a new faculty member right now or a new leader right now, even if I've already been hired, how might I want to pay attention to what you're going to say in terms of meeting needs? So I can't wait to hear what you say. Go ahead. Okay, great, great. Well, just to review for the listeners, I thought I would go through the typical steps in an academic job search. Yeah, perfect. Um, And then I'd go through those steps and talk to them about how they can keep in mind what the institution needs as they move through these steps. Yeah. So there are four basic steps to any academic job search, including leadership searches. First is the step that you do before you start looking at a job, and that's updating your CV or other supporting materials that you have. So that's step one. Step two is responding to the ad or position solicitation by writing a compelling letter of interest. Mm -hmm. The third step then is interviewing, 
And now these are a little bit different for faculty searches and leadership searches. For faculty positions, typically, this can be one step, an on-campus interview. For leadership positions, this is typically two steps. The first step is an airport-style interview Mm -hmm. after the search committee chooses a long list of about 10 to 12 candidates. They schedule rapid one-hour interviews with, say, about a dozen candidates. Those are, or at least before COVID, those were typically done in an airport hotel right? so that the many candidates can fly in and out. So if you make it through round one in the leadership search, the second search is usually then an on-campus interview of about three to four candidates. The fourth step, and we shouldn't forget about this, is after you've been offered the job, your negotiations. Mm -hmm. In each of these four steps, again, preparing your materials, writing a compelling letter of interest, interviewing, and negotiations, in each of those four steps, it's really more about them than it is about you for you to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to provide some examples of how to apply that principle at each one of those steps. Would that be helpful, Kim? Yes. Yeah. And and I'm just laughing to myself because I was just talking yesterday with some friends about um, the book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren. And the first sentence in that book is, it's not about you. And it just made me think, oh, my gosh, the same thing with uh, interviewing and doing a great job at your institution. It's not about you. (laughs) That's funny. What a coincidence. That's great. That's great. Okay. well, let, let me go through some examples of how this principle applies at each one of these steps. First is the updating your CV step. Rather than just keep your academic CV, you might consider creating a two-page executive summary that can be modified easily, keeping the institution's needs in mind. Um, It can be affixed as the first two pages of your academic CV. That way, you don't have to keep on changing your academic CV. Mm -hmm. Instead, you might consider adding this two-page executive summary that's easier to change. Does that make sense, Kim? Yeah. Okay. The second in writing a compelling letter of interest, what I do is I work with my clients to bullet out what the ad or position description says the institution needs. And I have them write their letter of interest along that line of explaining what they're bringing to the table to meet the institution's needs. Mm -hmm. In the third step, interviewing, I think the best way to prepare, everyone should always think about likely questions that they're going to be asked. It's a mistake to go into an interview just saying, okay, well, I guess I'm prepared and I think I'll wing it. You want to prepare for interviews. The best way to prepare is to answer likely questions that are based on the position description of what they need they're likely going to ask you those questions. Mm -hmm. And then finally, in negotiations, and this is one that may be less intuitive, but absolutely just as important because you can still lose the job during the negotiation phase, you should frame your requests around how you want to be successful at the job they need done, Mm -hmm. not just a list of what you want. Right. Okay. That's really critical. Yeah, everything. I love it. All those, each of those four elements are just like the fundamentals of communication. And you are really showing a responsiveness to, like you're saying, the the need. It kind of flips that the interviewing or job application on its head, because I think many of us who don't, if we've not thought about this or too junior at the whole process, think it's, I have to sell myself and I'm selling me and it's me, 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 all my successes and what I'm great at, what I'm good at and what I need, what I want. Rather, this is a lot deeper into like emotional intelligence. I love it. In fact, I use 
use that term, job emotional intelligence, in describing this to my clients. That's uh-huh. exactly right. That is exactly right. Uh-huh. So I thought it would be kind of fun to step through what I've seen as pretty common mistakes that clients make or that job applicants have made Ooh, good. Yeah. Uh, with respect to thinking about, you know, thinking about the institution. The first mistake is making yourself sound so great or important that you give the impression that you could take or leave the job. I think that people who are hiring want to hire someone who really wants to be at their institution and really wants the job. And again, that job emotional intelligence, uh, you know, that, that conveying the thought that you really are excited about the position. Who wants to hire somebody who is not so hot on, on the job? It makes me think of um, if you want to engage in a, in a relationship with someone, uh, find a, a life partner or a best friend. Why would you want to have a life partner or a best friend whose position is, eh, I'll take you or leave you. You know, if you, know, if you, you want to be my best friend or partner, whatever, I can find somebody else. There's no big, no skin off my, my back. Um, that kind of nonchalance. And I, and I get that. So it's um it's a desire to show confidence and you don't want to be too needy, but I think that risk is exactly I love how you pointed that out that well geez you know are we going to be doing you know you're going to be doing us a favor by coming here and that kind of reeks a little bit of um some arrogance that makes people feel like maybe you're not going to be uh, such a team player because you really don't seem to have any real desire or interest or a passion for work, working with us. You're treating this as kind of like, well, let me see if you come up to my standards. And that sounds a little right, bit risky. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One, one way that plays out as an aside is, you know, you always have time to ask questions during an interview and the kinds of questions that you ask, can tell a lot about yourself. In fact, I think I've seen people lose jobs more often or get jobs more often based on the questions that they ask during the interview. If you show that you've done research, that you've worked hard to learn about them, et cetera, in your questions, if the questions are what I refer to as substantive, Mm. that shows that you've put in some effort and that you really care about them and you care about the job. If you just ask, a, you know, a question like, well, what's it like to live in San Diego? That is such a throwaway and a lost opportunity. And it shows that you haven't spent the time and energy to learn about them to ask a substantive question. That's right. So mistake two is with respect to putting your materials together like your CV. If your materials are cookie cutter, and um, solely focus on who you are and what you've done without thinking about what they're looking for and need, those materials will not be as attention-grabbing and impactful for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, When people review things like CVs, they literally go through and they think about what they need and they'll highlight in the CV you know, the fact that you were the chair of a such and such committee and, oh, we need someone with that expertise. You need to make that easy on the people who are reading your CVs. After all, they have stacks of them and you need to make it easy for them to find that information. The third mistake is to feel compelled when they ask for a CV in uh, in the ad and they say you need to submit a letter of interest, a CV, and the names of four references, it, you, if you feel compelled to just use your academic CV, again, you're losing an opportunity. Mm-hmm. That's where the two-page executive summary comes in handy because it's a document that's easy to change and it highlights what you've done that is important to them. That summary can be attached as the first two pages to your academic CV. And then beyond updating, you don't need to change your CV at all. 
that kind of two-page executive summary, which is one of the first things that I work with my clients to put together, is a great document. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think maybe I worked with you on putting one together. Did I? You did. And and I want to get back to what you, I love, what you tra trained me to do was to have mantras. So I'm sure you're going to get to that or weave that in there. But yeah, you definitely worked um, with me on that. And it was so valuable because just like any uh, scholarly article or a book, uh, isn't it valuable or who's, who has the time? It's, it's the assumption that people have the time to look through your 50-page CV and that, that assumption that, well, clearly the, the grant reviewers have read my entire grant. No, the specific games page is really where the meat is. So make a good specific games page. Make a, a good, you know, pressy or executive summary. Nobody has the time or few people do to sift through all that material. So you're exactly right at the it's just a helpful um, tool for people to skim quickly, to get the, the keywords, see the uh, common denominator between you and what we need. So, yeah, you did, and it was incredibly valuable. Oh, I, I love that you brought up the mantra and that you remember that. So the mantra, just to skip to that, is uh, four or five points that you want to make about why you are especially prepared for this job, for what they need. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, you know, I, I try to have my clients do one sentence mantras, four or five of five of them at max, and uh, for them to really communicate why you are the best candidate for this job. So thanks for, I'm so thrilled that you remember that. That's great. <laughs> I, know, I, I, told, okay. I always, I always credit my job coach, Laura Schweitzer for that. And I, when I, in our leadership courses here at Hopkins, I oftentimes uh, use that as a reminder, a basic communication skill that so often um, academics, we are so excited by our research and our pr clinical practice that when someone asks us a question, we go into this long dissertation using these multisyllabic words. And sometimes in our zeal, we don't notice that the other person's eyes have kind of glazed over and they really don't understand where we're going. And it's the whole, the notion of the elevator pitch and the, and the brief CNN type headline sentences and bullet points that you just, like a politician, when they're asked a question, sometimes you wonder, they didn't answer that question at all. It's their go to the mantra, <laughs> you go to the mantra, you go to the mantra, and it should just roll off of your tongue as a reminder. Well, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm all about innovation, and I love creativity, and this opportunity to build something new really excites me. And so you just say that over and over and over again, that when people get together and review you as a candidate, they'll, they'll say, well, I know she's innovative and she likes to build things and she really is creative because you will have put that in their heads and beat them about the head with that, that those phrases will then consciously and subconsciously come up in their heads because you've repeated them so often that you want them to be right. very clear as like a politician does. that This is what I'm about and you don't let them forget right. it. Right. And if, if those things that you've repeated two or three times are directly related to what they need, that's especially going to be helpful. Absolutely. Okay. So mistake number four is writing a vanilla letter of interest and just summarizing your life's work. And clients that come to me who have gone through a couple of searches and failed, that's typically, mm -hmm. and, and they didn't even make it to the first round. Mm -hmm. It's typically because of that letter of interest and the fact that they've literally taken their CV and just repeated it. And again, that's a lost opportunity. Right. Um, the best way to do a letter of interest is to um, actually specifically talk about what they need, what they're seeking, and uh, how you meet those needs. So in interviewing, again, I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, that in order to prepare for an interview, um, well, first of all, mistake number five, not preparing at all and just thinking, well, you know, I, 
I should be able to answer the question. No, mm-hmm. you real you can be stumped by the simplest questions if you haven't thought in advance about what might be asked and what you might say. So the best way to prepare is to think about, you know, what they need. And here's an example. If you, if the ad says over and over again that they need someone who has handled budget cuts, Mm -hmm. they probably don't want to hear in the answers to your interview question how successful you are when you had lots of resources. Right. (laughs) And, you know, it's, it's amazing how clueless I can remember one candidate who was applying for a president of a community college who talked about how successful they were at funding and recruiting endowed chairs. Mm. Well, there aren't too many community colleges with endowed chairs, and I'm sure that went over like a lead balloon. This person is probably clueless, has no idea what it's like being at a community college. Right. And then, you know, it's a mistake not to think through who your audience is during the interview. Um, you know, at first it's probably going to be the search committee, but then in the second round, it may be the department and maybe the, the president. You know, you need to think through who your audience is and what they're looking for. And I have a great example of Mm. of that that has just stuck with me my entire career. When I was a postdoc at Mm. Duke, I sat through uh, job candidates' talks for an anatomy faculty position, an anatomy faculty position. And there was a candidate who was really great on paper and just what we were looking for. And during his seminar, when he was asked a question, he declared that his physiological detection of a synapse was more important than the anatomical demonstration of that synapse. And while technically that might be true, you can imagine in a room full of anatomists, that did not go over very well. Ouch. And it was the single reason that that candidate did not get the job. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that's a great example of how you've got to be, you'd have to know who your audience is. Not that you would change the answer to a question based on who they are, but at least give them homage, be be sensitive to it. Yeah. Be sensitive to it. Again, I I like to to use this term, uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, the steps that focus on what they need and how you can address their needs is like the job market equivalents of emotional intelligence. Yeah. I, I think you'll find this and you can probably, you probably have an example too. I was one, I, for many years, I taught for the AAMC, uh, the advanced, the mid career women yes. in medicine program. And I taught a seminar called the GPS to your leadership job destination. And that's exactly <laughs> where I first fell in love with you. And I was sat in that standing room only breakout room. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I was writing furiously. And that's how I, I learned of you and got a hold of you when I saw the job um, ad for Hopkins. That was exactly the course. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah. And I I wasn't coaching at that point, but you did reach out to me as an individual. So I was so happy to help you at that time. And it was so, so much fun. Um, I don't know if you were at the session though, um, when uh, one of the women in the audience interrupted me and said, you know, I don't think I should have to do all of that. I should just be able to say who I am, what I've done, and they should want me on that basis. Um, Yeah. So, you know, I would argue that you could be great, but if you don't demonstrate your sensitivity to and responsivity to their needs, no matter what you've done, you're probably not the right candidate for their job. And on that basis, I wouldn't hire Right. someone if they were totally insensitive to our needs. I love it. Um, that you I think you also said and I remember at least talking with you about that being in terms of this this idea of sensitivity that I remember I went someplace and I heard some higher level people saying, Are you kidding? We're at XYZ University. 
smart people are a dime a dozen. I can work with lots of smart people, but if they're mean, I don't have time in my life for mean, smart people. I can find smart people who are also nice. So I'd rather have smart, nice than smart, mean. And I that stuck with me as like, yeah, you know, you're not the smartest person in the room, uh, sir or, or woman. And so you might want to change or recalibrate your attitude because – Nobody wants to work in this, you know, academia is hard enough as it is, but you don't want to work with a jerk. And the other thing I wanted you to, to address, because I, re- I think I remember you having, having this conversation with you, is that remembering that when you are at the on campus or at the interview, you're always on stage, always. Mm-hmm. So that's true. When you're yeah. being shuttled from one meeting to another and it's an administrative assistant and it's a staff person or it's a trainee, they're going to be asked how they, what they thought of you. So you're always on stage. So I, I think it was a story about the use, you, you shared or somebody shared that even being ushered to the restroom or having a little break, the, People are watching you. They're watching you all the time to see how you behave and treat people who maybe you don't think are as important as other people. Absolutely. And then the the other advice that's kind of along that line is, you know, when you're out to dinner, probably shouldn't even have that glass of wine. But if you do, dinner is not a time to let your guard down and right. just relax because things that you say in dinner or... Um, I have so many stories I can tell. We had a, a dean's candidate come in who, and at the end of each of the candidate interviews, we had like a meet and greet with a wine and cheese. And this dean's candidate said something along the line of he hates to go to auctions or, or no, to flea markets with his wife because his wife likes to bargain and he just likes to pay full price. It's just not worth the effort. And people took note of that and said, well, is that how he's going to be as dean? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, you you just, there when you're on the job market, these kinds of job markets, people have choices. And yeah. so you have to be careful. You have to prepare. Mm-hmm. You, you have to, um, you have to really think about what they need in, in order to be successful. So basically that's, my message today, um, again, I think I, I do, as you said at the beginning, reminding my clients that it's more about the institution's needs than what they've got um, is, is the key to their success. And my successful clients really get it. They do. Yeah. So, um, again, I'm, I'm happy to have people send me questions and try to answer them and my email, which you did such a good job at saying at the beginning is schweitzerl at mac.com. And I really, I had fun sharing this information with you, Kim. Oh, Dr. Schweitzer, you are wonderful. I always uh, appreciate you and any opportunity I ever have to listen to you, hear you, be in the same room with you is always just a total pleasure. I always learn something. And I want to just maybe end with a little shout out to my fellow extroverted friends. I mean, uh, our introverted colleagues have a leg up on us because they have that magical gift of thinking before they speak. And so we extroverts, um, at least I tend to talk to think. And this is such an important reminder to me, a lesson that Laura just shared that, you know, you watch, watch your P's and Q's, as we used to say, think, uh, rehearse these things, plan these things, uh, watch loose lips and don't uh, guard guard yourself and be thoughtful about what you say, how you say it, and always being mindful of the needs. How can I serve needs? How can I meet their needs? It's not about me. It's not about me. So I love the lessons. As usual, Dr. Laura Schweitzer, you have been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us on the Faculty Factory podcast. Check her out. Email her at SchweitzerL. That's S C H W E I T Z E R L at Mac.com. Until next time, we'll see you or hear you back on the Faculty Factory. Thanks, Laura. Have a great day. Thank you, Kim. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement 
in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.